submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives and husbands, wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and he himself is its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the church does, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Well, as we get started uh, today, uh, I got to tell you something that happened this last week. Okay. Uh, as last week, as I was telling a, a few people about the passage I'm preaching on, uh, I had every single one but one have this effective response. <laughs> Glad I'm not the one preaching that one. Now, why would someone say that about this passage? This is God's word. It's beautiful stuff. It's helpful for us. Why would people have that response? Uh, well, I think there's there's probably three reasons why, uh, and and the first is that there's a there's just been a lot of bad teaching on this passage over the years. Uh, it, it seems like uh, uh, you know most of the passages in the Bible we don't have to worry about this, but uh, this passage it seems like uh, the evangelical church in America kind of just decided to go crazy as they've talked about it and they wrote book after book on it and just kind of playing off of each other, and there's just been a lot of damage. That's been done over the years on account of this passage uh, in misinterpreting it and mis and actually kind of really made it just misapplying the passage. Uh, and, and because of that, I kind of, as I approach the passage, I kind of have this feeling uh, that I got to do this whole like, it's not saying this, it's not saying that. Um, I'm going to try to not do that a lot today because it's just, it's really boring to sit through a sermon that does that. But and that's part of what's going on here. It's just, there's been a lot of bad teaching on this passage in the past. Uh, another reason why this passage sometimes is, is uh, not liked very much is because of some very poor choices in translation uh, and formatting in our Bibles today, some of which is just unavoidable. <laughs> and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, and the third reason why uh, some people maybe don't like this passage is, is because of not just like how it's been taught, but because of just the historical abuses in the world around submission. And uh, it's both within the church and, and without, you know, too often we humans have uh, forced others to submit to us. And we've exercised power over them. We've we've been oppressive against each other. And when we hear the call of submission uh, on the part of the less physically powerful sex to their spouse, we will naturally hear this as a as a propping up of tyranny. That's just a natural thing that our ears are going to do. We can't help but hear it, uh, even though that's not at all what this passage is saying. Um, which leads me to what the reason for discomfort around this passage is not. It's not because of something that this passage actually says. Uh, this passage is, is really quite lovely. It, it's one of the most beautiful passages in all of Scripture. Uh, it, it's the a passage that the pastor preached at mine and Julia's wedding. And, and the lovely jewel that this passage speaks to, it needs to be looked at more carefully and marveled over. Uh, because I believe that as we look at this lovely jewel that this passage has to, to show us, it's going to help us see how lovely God is. 
And in the process of seeing how lovely God is, we ourselves will become more love, lovely. And so before we we look at it more carefully, let's pray. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, I thank you that you have given us this lovely jewel of a passage. And I ask that I could present it uh, in its, at, at least a, a, a dim reflection of the beauty of that it is. And so I ask that we would receive what you have to give us today. In your name we pray. Amen. Uh, now, as we begin looking uh, at this passage, uh, first verse 21 and, and 22, you will uh, notice uh, something here. Let's see if I can make this thing work. I'll go back one slide there. Um, there you go. Thanks, Sadir. Um, if you look within your Bibles, if you have it with you, I have a few Bibles here on the screen. Uh, you'll notice that the ESV, the NIV, and the KJV and others, they all handle this passage differently, uh, both in terms of how they translate it, uh, but more how they format the text and the text headings. Uh, if you didn't know it, within your Bible, you see these little bold sections there. And the verse numbers, those don't exist in reality. Those are made up things uh, that editors have, have put there. Or the original text didn't have these things. It didn't have even punctuation. And so we, it's just kind of a tough thing to deal with. Uh, but when we go into, uh, to translate this into English, we need to put uh, chapter divisions. We need to put verse divisions. We need to put punctuation. And we need to make it make sense for the English speaker. Um but if you look at the ESV, NIV, and KJV, you'll notice that they all handle it differently. Some lump verse 21, which we ended with last week, uh, they lump verse 21 with verse 20. Uh, some make verse 21 the, the standalone verse, and then others lump it with verse 22 and following. And, and the reason why that they're having to do this is because you have to make translation decisions when you go from one language to the other. But in the original Greek, uh, there's no real uh, separation of paragraph or maybe even sentence all the way from verse 15 through the uh, first half of chapter six. It's all just like one running thought that Paul has. There's no real uh, division here. And they can do that in Greek. We can't. Okay. <laughs> and so our translations, they've tried to do it well, but they just kind of can't do it as well as we would like. Uh, and the ESV, which we're using today, is probably one of the, the most confusing of all of them. Uh, they normally do a pretty good job, but here they just kind of really messed up. Because if you go back to verse 21, you have this command for Christians to submit to one another. And the sentence just continues on into verse 22. Wives, to your own husbands. And then it, you know, it progresses on. But the whole conversation of wives submitting to their husbands is built on the mutual submission that all Christians are to pursue in all of their relationships with other Christians. But that's just really hard to bring across in a translation. And, and, and by the way, Paul, he is uh, not just speaking in a general about all of us. Uh, submitting to each other and then wives to their husbands. He also lists a couple other relationships. Uh, he talks about parents and their children, and he talks about the servant and, and his master, uh, their relationship in the ancient world. Uh, he doesn't use the term submission, but rather that of listening to, or we often translate it as like to obey. Um, children are to listen to their parents and servants are to listen to their masters. But then Paul goes on to say that parents are to be worth listening to, that they're not exasperating their children, being argumentative and, and doing all this, being harsh with them. Uh, and masters, likewise, they are to listen to their servants or obey if we translate it the same way the ESV has. Uh, in no sense at all is Paul speaking in favor of any form of oppressive uh, submission or deference to each other, from wives to husbands, parents, well, children to parents, and uh, servants to masters. But rather what he's talking about is a life of mutual submission, a life of mutual love, mutual respect for each other, acknowledging that there are distinct roles that we all play with each other. And one of those roles, one of those beautiful roles, is that of a husband or a wife, if you are married. 
And so Paul says that the husband, in verse 23 and on, it says that the husband is the head of the wife, which is just another way to say that uh, he is to be the head leader in the home. Uh, he's the head of state, well, the head of the home, okay? Uh, and he compares that leadership role to the role of leadership that Christ uh, plays within the church as its savior. And so he goes on to say that wives are to submit, not to all men, as some have just for some reason taught, um, but to their own husbands in the same way that the church is to submit to Christ. Now, the most important part of this passage is not necessarily the terms submission or uh, head, but rather what Paul says the role of leadership is to be and the type of person that he is calling wives to submit to. Please just look at the text. Paul isn't painting a picture of the type of man, uh, this, this selfish man baby, who, who gets his jollies from having other people look up to him. He's not calling wives to submit to that guy. Uh, he's not talking about that self-conscious, fragile man uh, who can't take criticism, who can't live without someone worshiping the ground he walks on, uh, or who needs someone to, uh, to need him in order to feel like a man. And, and no, instead, he's drawing our attention to Christ, this one who fundamentally was not concerned with himself, but rather with the ones that he came to lead. He didn't die for us so that, we could get an, uh, so that he could get an ego boost from having us worship him. Uh, he, he died for us because we needed him to. Uh, he, we needed a God to save us. He didn't need uh, us to see him as God in order to truly be God. He was God without us existing. Okay? He chose to do what he did for us willingly. And that's the type of leader that God is calling Christian husbands to be, which we'll talk about more in, in, in a little bit. Uh, but before we do, I, I, just, I want you to dwell on, on what Paul is saying here. There is... There is something beautiful to the husband and wife relationship that reflects the whole story of redemption that scripture speaks to. He, he's pointing not just to the home, but to Christ and to his relationship with the church. And, and because of that, if, if, you, if, if you have a, a distaste in your mouth uh, with the notion of submission of any kind, if you hear that word and you're like, ooh. You have that not because of what submission is itself, but rather because of the abuses that you've experienced or you've seen others experience. Because remember, Christ himself submitted to the Father's will, and that didn't make him less important. That didn't make him less valuable, and he did it willingly. And we were created to submit to Christ. And, and in neither case does submission uh, say anything negative about the one who submits. Uh, Jesus submitted and is not less valuable than the Father because he did. Uh, it doesn't diminish him. And likewise, when we submit to Christ or we submit to each other, we are not diminished either. We are counted as his friends and, and together as co-heirs of eternity. Now, in this fallen world, uh, submission, it, it too often bears the marks of oppression. Submission has often meant, um, I, I've heard dearly uh, beloved sisters in Christ say, it, 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 it tell me about how this passage has been weaponized against them. Uh, submission has often meant that a wife doesn't speak out against her husband's abuses. I thought that that's what it's meant. Uh, that, that she isn't involved in big decisions in the family or in the church. Uh, that she is kept in the dark. That she does what she's told. That uh, no questions are asked. That she serves without complaint. That she gets permission to do anything. Even, you know, when to go to the doctor. How much to spend at the doctor. Uh, it, she avoids anything that might potentially make her husband look uh, stupid or, or weak or evil. Uh, too often, and, and yes, so so called Christian men, too often men have weaponized this notion of submission to keep their wives as kind of like personal ego boosts. But that is not at all what this passage is affirming. Because Paul is telling us, wives, they're called to submit to their husbands 
who are uh, fulfilling this role that Christ himself has fulfilled for us. Uh, Wives who are are called to submit to their husbands are not called to put up with abuses or or to give up their civic rights. So because they become a wife, they no longer have the same freedoms that other citizens have. Uh, Sometimes the most godly thing a wife can do is to call the cops on her husband and make him learn to submit to his authorities. Um, you know, wives who are, who are called to submit to their husbands, who are following Christ's example, they're experiencing something good. But that is the point here. Called to submit to, to men who are following Christ's example, who are becoming worthy of it. No one, they won't ever be perfect. But people who are trying to follow him, not tyrants who will continue to abuse if they aren't stopped. That's the only context that submission in the home can actually work. Otherwise, it will quickly become abusive. And it's it's as though Paul knew that this is how people would twist what he is saying uh, because he clarifies what kind of husbands Christian men are to become in the rest of this passage. He he clarifies what responsibilities husbands are to have uh, toward their wives in order to make them safe to submit to. And fundamentally, he says that the role of the husband is to be one who self-sacrifices for the good of their wives. Uh, The husband is to love her as Christ loved the church, who, by the way, died for the church, who gave himself up for her. Now, that's not to say that wives aren't on the hook for loving their husbands. You know, wives, they have to submit, but they don't have to love their husbands. Like, no, like. We're, we're called to love and we're called to mutually submit to each other. But, but it is to say that the husband role is primarily that of self-giver. And, and this picture is rooted in what Christ did for the church. Uh, Paul tells us that Jesus gave himself up for us, that he might sanctify us, cleansing us with the washing of water with the word, that he might present us to himself in splendor without spot, or wrinkle of any kind, holy and without blemish. And and the picture that Paul is uh, is playing off of here is is obviously those ancient weddings, which are very much like ours, but, you know, just different. Um, Brides-to-be, they would go through a a, a similar beautification process. Uh, There would be baths. uh, There would be beauticians. The whole works went into it all. And like today, these brides back then, they worked hard uh, to to make their husband blush when he saw her, uh, that they wanted to be so beautiful that that man would have to be crazy in order to not marry her. Okay, They wanted that just like today. Uh, But the difference between the wedding ceremonies of that day and what Paul is describing in this text is that the husband-to-be wasn't the one who made the bride beautiful. She did that for herself, along with her, her bridal party. But when it comes to Christ and the church, we can't beautify ourselves. We couldn't wash the sin off of us. We couldn't sanctify us. We couldn't get the stains or the stink out. Uh, We needed Christ to do that for us. We needed him to sanctify us, to cleanse us. And Paul tells us that that is exactly what Christ did for us. In dying for us, he cleansed us of our sin and he beautified us. And in doing so, uh, he has won for himself a beautiful bride to enjoy. Uh, Tim Kelly, who once wrote in in his book, Meaning of Marriage, that Christ loved us not because we were lovely to him, but in order to make us lovely. It it, it is his love for us that has made us lovely in his sight. Uh, And that's how it is also supposed to work within our homes. Our love for each other especially that of the husband towards towards his wife, is to make us more lovely to each other. Uh, and, and you see this clearly in, in where it's not, right? Uh, you see it clearly in any marriage that's lost its love. Uh, people talk about, uh, they say a lot of different words, but it all kind of boils down to often the same thing. The, the joy washes from the face when they talk about the other person. Uh, the person becomes less and less beautiful. When love in your home is gone. But if you love that person, their flaws, uh, they kind of melt away 
and, and you see the soul of the person. Uh, they become more beautiful to you to the extent that they that they even become the measure of beauty uh, of beauty itself. Uh, it, it's one of the the cool thing that often happens in marriage. Uh, it's it's proven true for me at least. Uh, your spouse kind of becomes your type, you know. Even if maybe they weren't uh, when you when you first uh, started dating each other, you know. Your, your spouse becomes your type. You find the qualities that just are them uh, to be what defines beauty often. Uh, in, in my mind, eyes, no one measures up to Julia. And uh, I kind of base other people's beauty off of whether or not they remind me of her. Um, and, and I think now that I've, I've been married 10 years, uh, I'm, I've come to understand more of just like how you can grow old with someone and still find them to be the most beautiful person in the world. Um, even though you might shoot past the age uh, limit for how the world would define someone to be beautiful, it's it's your love for that other person that ends up making them more beautiful to you. It's your commitment to them that makes you prize them. It's, it's your intentional prioritizing of them that makes them lovely to you. And it's one of the lovely bonuses of marriage is that prioritizes love. Uh, the other person becomes more lovely. Sure, some of their flaws become more flaw-y. Uh, some, some flaws grow, some flaws wane, uh, but their beauty often becomes even more beautiful. And, and so what, happen, what often happens is that when you love your spouse, you end up receiving the benefit of a spouse that becomes more and more lovely. That's not always the case, but it's a general truth, which is why Paul can say what he says uh, in verses 28 through 31. Uh, Paul tells husbands that their care for their spouses uh, is to be uh, like their care for themselves, like you nourish and care for your own needs, not forgetting to eat, not forgetting to bathe, not forgetting to do what you need to do to care for yourself. Uh, you are to do that for your wife. You're to think of what your wife needs as though it is what you need, because it is. Uh, you are not two anymore, but one. When you care for her, you are caring for yourself. He tells us that uh, marital love is a self-love that is not self-centered. Marital love is a self-love that is not self-centered. And, and this is maybe the only relationship in your life where you will find this to be true. Uh, so often our expressions of love for the other person, you, you know this, they're, they're tinged with a, a self-protection interest. They're tinged with, a, well, I'll, I'll be nice to that person and then hopefully they'll be nice to me later on. There's that self-centeredness behind even the, the most wonderful things that we do. And, and in marriage, that can often, often uh, happen as well. But when you care for your spouse, you aren't just caring for some other person out there. You are caring for the person that you have been joined to. Um, and to, the, to a certain extent... Uh, marital love it, it it can also be about the other per uh, about getting the other person to make your life more harmonious. But the point that Paul is making is that when you show love to your spouse, you are showing love not to the other person, but also to yourself. Um, I think the truth of marriage is that it isn't it isn't just an agreement to be nice to each other, like so many of our other uh, partnerships are in this world. It's an agreement to be one. It's to make your uh, her joys your joys. Her sorrows your sorrows. Her dreams your dreams. Uh, in, in any friendship, but especially in marriage, your sorrows are consolidated as you face them together. And, and your joys are, are multiplied as you share them together. Uh, when Paul says that we have become one in marriage, he isn't really uh, talking about what you mark on your taxes, although maybe there, but he, he's talking about your whole life being joined to this person and, and in the most pure form that you will find on this earth, when you truly love your spouse, you are truly loving yourself. And, and this is ultimately why it is, it is so catastrophic and so painful when marriages fail. 
Uh, it, it's deeper than a broken friendship or, or a partnership. It's, it is, in a sense, the, the death of a person. Uh, the one become two. The joys become divided. And the sorrows are multiplied. And, and the shared hopes and dreams for the future are, are left unfulfilled. It's, it's why the, the disillusion for a marriage is, is always something to mourn, even if it sometimes is necessary in this life. Sometimes marriages fail. A selfishness that is not truly self-love rises in one or both spouses. And, and sometimes the result of that selfishness is that a divorce needs to take place in order to spare greater suffering. But, but in no way is a divorce ever what a Christian hopes for. Uh, because ultimately we know that a marriage is not just about the two who have become one, it's it's part of a, a very it's part of the very pattern of human existence. There's a mystery to marriage that is lost when it is broken. Uh, fall, uh, fall. Paul finally <laughs> says that all this marriage talk isn't really just about marriage. Uh, that's that's actually not the most important thing that Paul's talking about here. How we treat each other it's important, but that's not the big point here. Uh, Really, what he is concerned about is our relationship to Christ. He's he is concerned that husband loves their wives and that wives should submit to their husband, but he's really concerned about how we experience the love of Christ and how we submit to his leadership. Uh, the, the book study that we went through last spring, uh, Confronting Christianity by Rebecca McLaughlin, I listened to an interview of her a while back, and uh, she pointed out something I hadn't really, I hadn't really noticed before. Uh, it, and it's that this, this illustration of marriage in Christ is actually working in reverse of how we might expect Paul to use it. Uh, Paul isn't saying, oh, listen, Christ's relationship to the church is sort of like how marriage is supposed to be. No, he is saying this relationship that you have with Christ as his church which was planned before the foundation of the earth was laid, before humans ever existed, this relationship, this pattern on which all human flourishing uh, is, sorry, this pattern that you are swept up into as being uh, found in the body of Christ, this relationship is the foundation on which the pattern of all human flourishing is to be built on. The whole story of us being fruitful uh, with each other, of multiplying, of loving each other, it's built on the foundation of God's relationship to humanity. Marriage and, and these other relationships that he speaks to, they are the reverberations of the melody that God is playing when he created all of humanity and the universe itself. And to the extent that you know Jesus and what he has done for you on the cross, you will, ex you will understand what marriage is supposed to be like. You will pattern marriage off of Christ and his relationship with the church. But then the illustration kind of flips around and the cycle begins anew. Uh, it, it, is, it is often through getting to experience uh, marriage as it's supposed to be that we then get to understand more of the relationship with Christ, what it's really supposed to be like. It, it, it's like with parenting. Um, we see a faded, dim picture of, of what it must be like for God to relate with us as we uh, relate with, to our children. Uh, in, in many cases, it's, it's humiliating to be a parent, uh, and yet it fills us with more healthy pride, sometimes unhealthy, but with more healthy pride and passion than you ever thought you were capable of. Uh, marriage is much the same way. As we experience the joys of a healthy marriage, we get to taste a little bit of like, oh, okay, that's what heaven might just be like a little bit. And when you taste a bit of heaven, you then want to recreate that a bit when you... Um, when you live in this world. That's the beauty that God intends for us within uh, our marriages in this life, where we get to know what marriage is supposed to be by getting to know God. And as we get to know what marriage is supposed to be, like more as we experience it, we, we get a taste of more of what God is, is like. It's a beautiful cycle here. And yet, this world is broken. 
And the pictures that we see in our families and in our marriages are often not at all like how God relates to us. Our our relationships lie to us about who God really is and what he's like. Uh, It's like with our parents. If, If you have a poor relationship with them, you will likely have a difficult time calling God your father or or seeing him as the ever-loving, compassionate, lawful leader and grace giver that he is. It, It often takes a long time to separate the failures of our parents from the God whose love they were meant to imitate to us. And the same thing holds with marriage. When we hear about the marriage of Christ to his church and the beauty that it is to express, uh, we can have a difficult time separating his pure love for us from the oh-so-present selfishness of ourselves and of our spouses as we relate to each other. And when that happens, um, we come away not only with a flawed view of who God is, but also what marriage is ultimately meant to be. But Paul today is calling us to delve deeper into the mystery that is marriage, into the mystery of how God loves the church, into the mystery of how God loves you. And as you delve deeper and reflect deeper on that mystery, he invites you to reveal what you learn about it to the world around you through the way that you live within your marriage. And so he concludes uh, calling the husband to love their wives and the wives to respect their husbands. He knows that the ways we treat each other often say more than our words. When our actions say, I love you or I respect you, we are also saying to our spouses, I, I love you because I believe that God loves you and I think he is right to do so. Or I respect you because I believe that, that when God sees you, he is proud of you. For the Christian, our love or, or lack thereof, it's, it's never just communicating the place that that person has in our own hearts, uh, place in, in, with us. It, it's communicating what we believe about their place with God, or what, at least what it should be. Uh, we're making judgments about what we believe God should do with them. And because of this, the Christian family, more than, uh, than even the corporate times of worship, in the congregation, the Christian family is the place where the gospel is most clearly and regularly shown or hidden. And so, as Christians, we need to concern ourselves with and prioritize ourselves as families to be about the gospel, to be about sharing the good news with uh, each other and with the world around us. Our, Our love and our mutual submission to each other proclaims a God who gives himself up in order to love us and make us more lovely. I, when I, when I first was considering being married as like a teenager, I didn't think that Uh, getting married could be the most effective gospel proclamation I had ever given my life. I didn't think that that was the case, but, but now reflecting on childhood and experiencing marriage a little bit, a few minutes here. um, Yeah, it really is. As I see the devastation in a lot of people's lives who have gone through broken marriages and, and within the church, um, that has been a more powerful proclamation or, or uh, obstruction of the gospel than any message that a, that a pastor will share. So what you do with each other matters. It really matters. And so I encourage you that as we go from here, dwell on this mystery that is marriage and on the, and on our, the mystery that is our relationship with Christ. Uh, that you would not see the hidden gospel that we often experience in this world, but that you would experience and know the revealed gospel that is found in the word of in the word of Christ, and oftentimes expressed within our marriages. That you would experience and know that, and let that love make you more lovely. Let's pray, dear Heavenly Father. I thank you uh, that you have loved us and and have made us lovely, that you have sanctified us in Christ. And Lord, I ask that you would continue to sanctify us as your church. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.